Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. I've got just a few notices to give you uh, before we get started. And the first is that we finally have a date for the postponed APCM. Just in case you don't know, uh, the APCM is that big annual meeting we have every year with reports on the, the past church year and when uh, those on the electoral roll can vote for the church wardens, members of the church council and deanery synod. It's a very important meeting. We were supposed to have it way back in March, but it was postponed for obvious reasons. And so now we're going to have an extra short APCM after the service on Sunday the 4th of October at about 11 o'clock. Uh, now, I'm sorry to say that if you're unable to come to church to, to attend that meeting, uh, unfortunately there's no lawful way to be able to vote without attending uh, the meeting in person. That's just uh, the way the rules are. But it, it would be great to see you if you're able to make it on Sunday the 4th of October after the service. I'd also like to give you a quick update on live streaming the services. We are very close to being able to live stream our services. Paul Brayshaw and a number of other guys in the church have been very busy installing the equipment which we were able to purchase because some of you were very generous in your donations. And so very soon, the service you watch online will be the very same service that's happening live in church on a Sunday morning. And so, if you want to watch the online services when they go live, it'll be easy for you to find them. They're on our YouTube channel, and you can access them in the usual way. They'll just pop up uh, where you usually find them. However, I think I, I need to say that when we do go live, and we don't quite have that date yet, it might be in a couple of weeks' time, hopefully. Uh, when we do go live and live stream our services, if you, you normally watch those services through the church website, now would be a good time to get used to watching them on YouTube uh, because we're not quite sure whether we're going to be able to live stream direct to the church website. You might only be able to watch them on YouTube. Uh, so it'll be good uh, to practice. Uh, and then the final note is about, is about harvest. Uh, next week is our harvest-themed all-age service. That's on the 20th of September. And as usual, we're going to be collecting food for Paul Food Bank uh, to help those who are struggling to feed themselves. It's a really good cause, uh, supporting people in great need. So uh, let's give generously if we're able. Uh, if you're attending the service on the 20th, at St. Paul's, uh, then you can just bring your donation with you on the day. Uh, but if you're watching the service online and you can't come on the Sunday, uh, what you can do, if you like, is just drop off your donation at the church office any weekday morning from 9.30. And if you want some ideas about what to donate, uh, there, are, there will be ideas on the notice sheet and in the notice section of the church website. Okay, well, then let's get started. Let's really focus our attention on God, and we're going to do that by saying this opening prayer together. God of our days and years, we set this time apart for you. Make us more like Christ, so that our lives may glorify you. Amen. Well, we're going to sing uh, two songs now, and our opening song is a call to worship. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. Now, let's worship our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who died for us, rose victoriously back to life, and one day he will return to be with us forever.
that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all
Jesus Christ said. The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. And we, we say the confession together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son, and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. Well, it's now time for our main Bible reading, and it's read by Bob Venning. We're back in Acts the book of Acts, continuing our study of the mission of the early church and learning about how they spread the good news about Jesus. We've reached Acts chapter 15, which tackles a huge question. It was certainly huge at the time, and it's very relevant for our lives. The question is this, do non-Jewish Christian men need to be circumcised in order to get saved? In other words, is faith in Jesus enough to get saved, or do we need to follow the Jewish customs too? Very important question. Let's find out the answer. Our reading this morning from Acts chapter 15. So we begin at verse 1, and we go through to verse 35. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they travelled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice between you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, 
just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. So then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we have saved, just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for ages. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas two men who were leaders among the brothers. With them they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria and Cilicia. Greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality you will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. The men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read and were glad for they were for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers. After spending some time there, 
they were sent off by the brothers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel reading is taken from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you for your word, the Bible. How important it is to us for the truth that it conveys to us and pray that you would help us to understand it, to take it on board, to believe it and may our lives be changed as we ponder your amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, like so many uh, boys and maybe girls too, I I used to dream about being a professional footballer. I imagined scoring the winning goal in a World Cup final and lifting that cup. I used to practice for hours and hours in my garden. I remember uh, trying to copy that famous goal. Do you know it? The the goal that Paul Gascoigne scored against Scotland in Euro 96. I mean, what a brilliant goal that was. We kind of flicks it over the defender's head and then he volleys it really hard into the bottom left-hand corner. And I remember uh, trying to copy that and then I remember going back to school at the end of the summer holidays and all the boys were doing it every playtime, trying to flick the ball over one another's heads and score. I really wanted to get into uh, the West Ham team and then get into the England team. But eventually my dream came crashing uh, crashing down uh, when I attended the trials for my local football team, Hearn Bay United. And I remember standing there at the end of the tryouts as one of the coaches read a list of the boys' names. 
Uh, the boys who had passed the trial and he got to the end of the list and I realised he wasn't going to say my name. I, I, I didn't get in. It was such, hard, such a hard lesson to learn. You know, if I'm not good enough for Hearn Bay, well, I've got no chance of playing for West Ham. I've got no chance of getting into the England team. Well, you may have never wanted to get into a football team, but I'm sure there are other things you wanted to get into. Uh, maybe you wanted to get into a particular school or college or university. Uh, maybe you tried really hard to get into a particular job. Uh, maybe you've experienced how hard it can be to get into a group of friends. Uh, most of us will have tried at some point or will try in the future if, uh, if, especially if we're young, to, to get into a relationship. But we're going to think about this question. It's so important. How do you get into the most important and the longest-lasting club or organization that has ever existed? How do you get into the kingdom of God? How do you get into God's family? How do you become one of his saved people? And it's so important because if you go through your whole life focusing your energy on getting into the right school or, or group of friends or relationship or job or sports team, and if you spend all your time thinking about that, then you will have missed the only thing that really matters for eternity. How do you get into the kingdom of God? What must you do to be saved? And that's what this chapter here in Acts chapter 15 is about. It's such a crucial chapter in this book because it changes everything for the church. In it, in this chapter, we read about the first ever church council. It was a meeting of the apostles and other church leaders in Jerusalem. And they got together to discuss a very important issue. At the heart of this meeting were two key questions. First of all, what does a person need to do to get into the family of God? And secondly, how must you live once you're in the family? So we've got this council, church council meeting in Jerusalem, and they met because of something that happened in Antioch. You see, Paul and Barnabas returned from their first missionary journey uh, to the church in Antioch. So they came back to the church in Antioch. It was the church that sent them out to spread the gospel in the first place. And when they get back to Antioch, they tell about the successful mission they've had. They, they tell about all the, the Gentiles, that is, all the non-Jewish people who have become followers of Jesus as a result of them preaching the gospel. But then there's a problem. Uh, verse 1 says, Certain individuals came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers... Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And so what we see here is that some Jewish Christians, they, they, they come along and they start teaching these new Gentile Christians that they're not actually saved yet. They say, that, look, there's something else you need to do in addition to believing. There's something else you need to do. You need to get circumcised. And later on in verse 5, at the Jerusalem council, it happens again. So verse 5 says, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Now this is so interesting because Luke, who, who wrote this book, says these men were believers. These men who said the Gentiles had to get circumcised, they were believers. They were Christians. And yet, he says, they were also Pharisees. So it, it looks like this happened, that some Pharisees had converted to faith in Jesus, that they firmly believed in Jesus, and yet they didn't believe that faith in Jesus was enough for a Gentile person to get saved. They believed a Gentile had to go through the same kind of procedure that a, a person used to have to go through when they converted to Judaism. Their theory was something like this. 
that the Jews are God's chosen people. And so if you want to be a Christian, you've got to become a Jew and do the things that Jewish people do. For, for example, you had to get circumcised if you're a man. Now, we kind of typically view the Pharisees as kind of being the pantomime villains. We want to boo them. Ooh, Pharisees, boo. But it seems like these Christian Pharisees had really good intentions. They just wanted to be sure that these Gentile converts were truly saved. But what they proposed threatened to undermine the gospel. It threatened to undermine the future of the church and the truth about how a person gets saved. They were effectively saying that faith in Jesus is not enough. They were saying, you can't count on Jesus alone to save you. They were saying, there, there are certain things you need to do to, in addition to achieve your salvation. They were saying, what you need, you need grace, but you need grace plus something else. Grace plus circumcision. And they were very wrong. So this led to a huge debate, and in fact, it sounds like there was a huge argument. Maybe there was even some shouting. Verse 2 says, this brought, brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So they had a great big argument about who was right. Does, does a person need to get circumcised to be saved? And this can seem strange to us today, because in our Christian culture... Uh, we often shy away from serious theological debate and disagreement. And that's because many Christians today think, you know, we've got to preserve unity at all costs. And therefore, they, they say, look, we shouldn't, we shouldn't really talk about the divisive subjects. You know, let sleeping dogs lie. Let's not talk about them. I've even heard Christians utter the words, doctrine divides and they just think, you know, we just shouldn't talk about doctrine. We, we shouldn't talk about what Christians believe. We shouldn't insist that people obey the Bible's teachings. Because when you do that, so they say, it leads uh, to arguments and disharmony. But the truth matters. And Paul and Barnabas understood this. They understood that this was, was a huge issue. And the church had to get it right because people's salvation was on the line. They could not simply agree to disagree. So many Gentiles were becoming Christians. They had to know the answer. They had to sort this one out. They had to determine what does a person actually need to do to get into the family of God? What they actually need to know the answer to this question. What is required for a person to get saved? Are we saved by grace alone? Or do we need grace plus something else? So to sort it out, Paul and Barnabas and some others too, they went up to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles and elders, the church leaders. And at this meeting of the Jerusalem council, those Christian Pharisees made their point again. They said that Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. And so this debate, this important debate, wasn't just about circumcision, it was about whether these newly converted Christians who were springing up all over the place, whether they must become Jews and keep the Old Testament traditions like the food laws and observe the Passover and keep certain days holy and offer sacrifices, things like that. Well, there was a lot of discussion and then Peter stands up and Peter recounts some of his history. He says in verse 7, brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Now, Peter's talking about the events recorded in Acts chapter 10, when he had that vision of the sheep being lowered down with the unclean animals in it, and then how he went to preach the gospel to Cornelius and Cornelius's friends and family. Now, they were Gentiles. Peter used to think that the gospel was just for Jewish people, but then through this experience, God taught him that even Gentiles can get into the family of God. And so he says in verse 8, God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them 
just as he did to us. Peter's saying, look, when Cornelius and his family and friends believed in Jesus, God didn't tell them to get circumcised. He just gave them the Holy Spirit straight away as a sign that God accepted them. Peter says the Holy Spirit was able to live inside of them because God had already made them clean. He had purified their hearts by faith. That's in verse 9. Now, Peter's saying, like, look at this. God must have accepted them. They must have been saved without circumcision because God gave them the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit would not come and live in a person who was unclean, unaccepted, unforgiven, and unsaved. So Peter wraps things up, wraps up his testimony. He turns and says to the Pharisees, look, why, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? In other words, look, you're being so unfair. Why are you telling the Gentiles they've got to obey the law to be saved when us Jews have failed to obey the law ourselves? If getting saved depends on the Old Testament laws and obeying them, then we are all doomed because we have all broken it. So that, that's Peter's point. And so he drives it home in verse 11. He says, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Nobody can save themselves by keeping the Old Testament laws. Grace alone saves. Salvation is a totally free gift and a totally undeserved gift that God gives to those who put their trust in Jesus and accept him as their king and saviour. It's a free gift, grace alone. I wonder if you've accepted it. Well, next up to address the council after Peter is Barnabas and Paul. And we don't know a lot about what they said because this is a very condensed account of what happened. But verse 12 simply says, the whole assembly, so everyone gathered there, uh, became silent uh, as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done through the Gentiles, among the Gentiles, through them. So Paul and Barnabas have the turn, and then it's James's turn to speak. James's turn. But this isn't the James, the son of Zebedee. James, the son of Zebedee, was killed back in chapter 12. This is James, who was the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote the letter of James, and who appears to have been the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And James says, look, what we've heard from Simon, that is Simon Peter, is true. He says it's true. At verse 15, the words of the prophets are in agreement with what Peter has said. The words of the prophets agree with what Peter has said. Now, this is so important. You see, we've just heard from Peter and Paul, two giants of the Christian faith. But James doesn't just take their word for it. He doesn't just go, oh, you must be right because you're Peter and Paul. He wants to know what the Bible says on the subject. Because James knows that the Bible is true, authoritative, and reliable. He knows that even though he's, he is James, the leader of the Jerusalem church, he knows that he has to submit to the teachings of the Bible. He knows that if you want to know the truth about God and if you want to know what to believe about God and how to live the Christian life, well then you've got to get it from this book, the Bible. He knows it doesn't matter how clever a person is or what their status is in the church. It doesn't even matter if they're one of the apostles. If what they say does not fit with the Bible's teaching. You should not believe it. But if it does fit with the Bible's teachings, then you should. You see, the lesson here for us, or one of the many lessons for us, is that we should weigh up people's teaching against Scripture. Oh, now, James does this. And he, he quotes one prophet, just one prophet, but he does say that the words of the prophets, plural, are in agreement with what Peter's said. James wants us to know that even though he's just going to quote one prophet, that actually what Peter has said is in agreement with the teaching of the whole Old Testament. And, and so he then quotes Amos, Amos chapter 9 
to prove that it always has been God's plan to save Gentiles too. So Peter is right. As verse 11 says, it is through the grace of the Lord Jesus that we are saved. There is nothing we can do to save ourselves. Obeying God's rules won't make us good enough. Being a good person won't make us uh, good enough. Following certain traditions won't make us good enough. Going to church won't make us good enough. We cannot make ourselves good enough. God's grace, his completely free, completely undeserved, loving kindness is the only chance any of us have of getting into God's family. And so, as we finish, let's round up some of the points of, of application. You know, what can we take away from this chapter? What does it mean for our lives today? Well, here's uh, one point. Here's the first point. You need to be saved. The underlying assumption in this passage is that both Jew and Gentile need to be saved. We all need to be washed clean in the sight of God. That's the first point of application. Uh, secondly, uh, you don't need to be Jewish to be saved. You don't need to become Jewish. Gentiles, like uh, most of us are probably, uh, can, can be saved too. We, we don't need to become practicing Jews. Uh, third, that there's nothing you can do to save yourself. Obeying God's rules won't cut it. Do you understand that? Your salvation does not depend on your perfect obedience. Point four, God's grace is the only way you can get saved. It's the only hope you have. Now, this is really good news, that God's grace is the only way you can get saved. And not just because it means like, that men don't need to be circumcised. You know, it means we, we don't have to change our ethnic identity. We don't have to throw all of our Western culture in the bin. We don't have to become practicing Jews. We don't need to stop eating bacon. Uh, we don't have to start celebrating all of the Jewish feasts. Uh, we don't have to go on a pilgrimage or anything like that. Like, neither do you have to go through life worrying uh, about whether you're good enough to be saved. Because you're not good enough to be saved. But God is gracious, and he freely forgives all who trust and follow Jesus. Do you trust and follow Jesus? Is he your personal saviour and king? Do you rely on him? Do you believe in him? Because that is what is required to get saved. You know, you don't have to do a whole bunch of other stuff to qualify. You don't have to do a whole bunch of other stuff before God washes your sin away. If your faith is sincere and genuine, you are instantly saved the moment you first believe. So if we're saved by grace, does that mean we are free to do whatever we like? If salvation is God's free gift to those who believe, does it mean we can just ignore God's commandments in the Bible? No. When James gives his verdict, he agrees that we are saved by grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ. But then he says, he says, look, there are some rules we should give to the Gentiles for them to obey. And he highlights three rules in particular. He says, look, they, they should stay away from anything that has anything to do with idolatry. He says they should avoid sexual immorality. And they should not eat the meat from strangled animals or that has blood in it. Now, it's not entirely clear why James mentioned just these three rules, because you know, if you know the Bible, you know there are lots of other rules, other things Christians should and should not do. But it seems likely that the reason James focused on these three things is because they were all associated with the worship that was going on in the pagan temples around them. And so James is making quite a simple point. He's saying, look, yes, Gentiles, you are saved, and you're saved by grace alone. There's nothing else you need to do to get saved. But now that you are saved and you are forgiven, avoid idolatry. As someone famously said, faith alone saves, but saving faith is never alone. What does a person need to do to get into the family of God. 
Believe in Jesus. Believe that he is the saviour and lord of the world. Have faith in him. Trust him to save you. Grace alone saves. But how must you live once you're in the family? Once you've been saved, how must you live? You must try to live God's way. You must turn away from sin. Stop living like the unbelievers around you in idolatry and sexual immorality. And do your very best to live God's way. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that we are saved by grace alone and by grace alone through faith. Thank you that our, our salvation and our forgiveness does not depend on us and what we do, but on Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Thank you that this means we can be sure of our salvation because it does not depend on our own personal accomplishments. And yet we know that saving faith is never alone. We understand that once you've washed away our sin, you expect us and you enable us by your spirit to do good works. And so please help us all and lead us to turn away from sin and put our old ways behind us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord who knows all the secrets of our hearts. Father, as we come to your table to partake of bread and wine, the body and blood of your Son. May we come in meekness of hearts and humility of spirit, knowing that we cannot approach in our own righteousness, but because of your great goodness and gracious mercy in sending your only begotten Son to die on the cross in our place and to pay the price for our sin. Help us all to live in newness of life and to walk worthily before you all the days of our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for your worldwide church. Help us never to despair at our increasingly fractured society. We pray for the wisdom for their leaders, especially when they are faced with difficult decisions concerning resources and state policy. We pray for our church and for each, each one of us as we seek to promote outreach into the community and maintain our life of worship and service. We pray that through the example of your, our Christian living in your church family, we may be guided in the ways of Christian discipleship. Lord, in your mercy. God of love and strength, your son forgave his enemies, even while he was suffering shame and death. Strengthen those who suffer for their faith. When they are accused, save them from speaking in hate. When they are rejected, save them from bitterness. When they are imprisoned, save them from despair. Lord, in your mercy. Creator God, we pray for our world, where through television we see the misery and tragedy brought about by wrong choices into our homes day by day. We pray for wisdom and compassion in all negotiations and decisions taken by our world and local leaders and ask that there be humility in leadership and responsibility for right actions shared by all. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those that we know who are sick lonely, anxious, in some other special need at this time, as we share a brief moment of silence together. As we have named them in our hearts, so let them feel your presence, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. 
Merciful God, give us ears to hear and minds to understand the message of immortality for the children of your kingdom, so that we may look forward with patience and confidence to that time when we will join you in the peace of eternity. And we specially pray for any we know who recently died and are in that journey to you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of love and life, with thankful hearts we acknowledge our lives to be a gift of your grace, renewed every morning and nurtured every day in your tender care. Keep us faithful to the knowledge this day and the week ahead will bring. Make us a blessing to those whose lives we touch and show us how to receive in gratitude the blessing their lives bring to ours. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let's say together the prayer that our Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And now let's pray uh, the collect, or lead us in the collect or prayer for today. Almighty God, whose only Son has opened for us a new and living way into your presence. Give us pure hearts and steadfast wills to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're going to finish with a song that celebrates God's amazing grace to us in Jesus. We could never be good enough to earn salvation, but in dying for us and rising back to life, Jesus has done everything necessary to earn us salvation. And so, let's sing, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me?
Okay, well, that's it for another week. I hope you found the service helpful and encouraging. Uh, Do remember, please, that uh, next Sunday it is our Harvest-themed all-age service. And so if you want to make a donation to Paul Food Bank, uh, please uh, remember uh, to do that. And if you watch these services and you'd like to... Uh, you'd like to support the mission and ministry of the church, please consider uh, doing that uh, financially. Uh, To give, uh, please contact the church office to find out uh, the details, uh, the contact details for the church on the church website. We're going to finish with a prayer, so let's pray. Psalm 119 verse 68 says, You are good, and what you do is good. And Father, we thank you that this statement about you is true. You are good. And what you do is good. We thank you for the many blessings you've given us. They are so numerous, they cannot be counted. Now, may we all leave this service built up in the faith, knowing you better, loving you more, delighting in your word more than ever. May we leave excited to serve you, in the world you have made, and ready to share our faith with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and watch over you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly on you and give you peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.